Okay, so that was Grover. And, uh, you know, once we kind of did the basic Grover, we sort of took the key ingredient in Grover, which was about trying to distinguish between a rotation of zero and a rotation of something like square root p, and really soup it up to get, you know, stronger version of this quantum subroutine, rotation estimation. Uh, so we studied rotation estimation a lot in subsequent lectures. And this is like maybe the most powerful sort of subroutine or maybe even paradigm in quantum computing. It's like the one, you know, unlike the Hadamard transform where like, okay, well, it's sort of like the one algorithm where you can like try to at least think about like, how could I productively use this to solve problems? Like the Hadamard transform is very specific. You just run it and like, hope that something good happens. But people these days are still thinking about like, okay, what can we use this sub rotation estimation subroutine to maybe do? And among other things, you can do it to get like a sort of super Grover, if you will, like sort of the ultimate form of Grover, which is like given, and this, we, we talked about this on like the homework, I guess, given code C with a P fraction of satisfying strings. You can estimate uh, P to plus or minus epsilon with um, running the code C, something like uh, square root P divided by epsilon many times. Okay, maybe it's a little hard to interpret, like this square root P, wait, sorry, this should be down here, 1 over square root P epsilon. Should make a note, fix that in the notes. Uh, just going to say, um, classical algorithms. So for this, this, this kind of task, like, you know, you have some code that returns 0 or 1. You want to estimate how many fraction, what fraction of strings make it output 1. The obvious classical way to do it is just like pick a bunch of random strings, plug them into C, see what fraction of times it outputs 1. Um, and if you do that, you know, a little bit of statistics and Chebyshev's inequality will uh, show that for classical algorithms, wait a minute. No, no, I had this right. Yeah, never mind, I had this right. Uh, you need to do this many times. And this, again, this is the square root of this. So again, this is like square root speed up hallmark of quantum algorithms. It's basically like for any kind of statistical problem, even more properly, like a statistical problem where you use Chebyshev's inequality con to control the, the guarantees, for any sort of statistical problem like that, like this kind of quantum algorithm can get like a square root speed up over classical. So that's, again, like nice and all. Although people are kind of concerned, you know, the square root speed up is pretty good, but, you know, even when we get quantum computers, probably it'll subsequently be an extremely long time before like their, their clock speed is as fast as our awesome classical computers. And so, you know, if you get a factor speed up of like square root of a million or square root of a billion, but then your clock speed is like a million times slower, is that a speed up? Maybe not. But, um, okay, it's interesting. Okay. Um, so that was cool. And then, uh, while we were doing this rotation estimation algorithm, we, you know, made this observation that, you know, if you, you know, rotation estimation, you know, basically the input, part of the input is like an upper quantum operation that does a rotation. And, you know, the rotation estimation algorithm did some things where like, okay, I'll do that operation not just once, but maybe I'll do it 10 times or I'll do it 100 times. And, if you just get this operation and you need to do it 100 times, then that costs you 100 times. But we saw that, you know, perhaps if for some reason you were in a situation where you happened to know, like, a very efficient algorithm for doing the uh, unitary 100 times or a 
a thousand times or 10 to the n times, then you could actually speed this up a lot. So if you happen to know an efficient algorithm for uh, you know r, if r is your rotation or your unitary, repeated 10 to the n times, like 10 to the 1,000 times, for example, then uh, you can use rotation estimation to get something really great. Uh, you can get like n digits of precision in estimating the rotation angle. So you can efficiently you know, estimate rotation angles to like n digits of precision. You know, maybe n is like a thousand. Right? So this is kind of like estimating it to plus or minus uh, one over ten to the n. Okay, and that's kind of um, cool if you can do it. It's almost like an algorithm, you know, that uh, you know, if you think about the angle that R is rotating as it got like a thousand digits long, it's kind of like you have like a separate algorithm for estimating each of the digits. So you don't just do that by trying to get a really precise measurement of how much rotation is happening, but like there's like a magic trick for estimating the digits separately. Okay, and then finally, uh, this all came together with the quantum factoring algorithm. Uh, often called Shor's algorithm, of course, because uh, guy Peter Shor was the first to come up with an efficient algorithm for factoring in 1994. As we said, it was, he based his algorithm on the quantum Fourier transform, but we saw a different algorithm that's based on rotation estimation. Ultimately, they're kind of the same algorithm, and uh, if you did like the very last problem on the homework, you'll maybe see how um, our rotation estimation method for, for solving factoring kind of led you to the discrete Fourier transform. So that was that connection. But uh, yeah, so finally, uh, in lectures, I guess, 22 to 24, you may remember that we saw a quantum algorithm for factoring n-digit numbers And uh, we didn't actually do the calculations, but I'll just tell you, it's order n cubes time, or work. Um, yeah. That's, but this order n cubed is basically because, like, um, well, the central quantum algorithm that you're doing rotation estimation on is, like, multiplying. It's, like, times 2 mod n, or, like, times b mod n. So it's basically multiplying two n-digit numbers. And like the normal way of multiplying two n-digit numbers, the grade school way, which you would probably use in an actual implementation, is order n squared time. And then in rotation estimation, like you, you know, do that with r and r to the 10 and r to the 10 squared and all the way up to r to the 10 to the n. So that's where the other factor of n comes from. OK, so uh, we can you know, review all our questions. Is this factoring like an important task? And the answer to that is yes, although for a funny reason, it's not like there's an inherent real reason that like for like practical, you know, I don't know, engineering, you would want to like factor huge numbers because thousand digit numbers normally never, well, don't arise in like some real world engineering context. But uh, in the 70s, people discovered that like the problem of factoring thousand digit numbers is a great puzzle. It's a great puzzle because it's easy to generate really difficult challenges. You just multiply together two random primes, output the result, and say, hey, try to factor this. And it's a cool puzzle because you know the answer because you generated the factors yourself, but we don't know any classical algorithm that can efficiently factor 1,000-digit numbers. We only know exponential time algorithms. And because of this, it was like the basis for like almost all cryptography until recently. And you know why until recently? It's because, well, in 1994, they discovered a quantum algorithm, if it could be run, would crack this problem. And so ever since then, people were like, man, we should try to find some new puzzles that we can use for cryptography in place of these ones that we use based on factoring. 
And uh, they've got some good ones based on lattice problems. And so there's this field called post-quantum cryptography. And like even NIST is like telling all the companies like time to move your cryptography to this because we don't currently know that quantum computers can break this, these new kinds of puzzles. Um, OK. Is this a major speed up? Yeah, it's also a major speed up because it's a polynomial time algorithm. And uh, the best classical algorithms we know have some running time that's like exponential, not in n, but it's basically exponential in the cube root of the number of digits. And also, the base of the exponential is really large. So it's, it's an infeasible algorithm once, one is, once n is, I don't know, 500 or something. And finally, is it of theoretical interest? And the answer to this is also kind of yes, for a reason that I would like to mention, which is the following. Um, it has to do with like you know P and NP stuff. So uh, if you cast your mind back to your 251 days, maybe you remember about this NP, pro uh, all the problems that where um, there's an efficient way to verify solutions. And you might remember that it contains P, so like all the problems where there's like an efficient way to find solutions. And so some problems that are in NP are also in P. Like if you can efficiently check, if you can efficiently find solutions, then you, know, you can efficiently also check a solution that's given to you, because you already know what the solution is. Um, so there's this like huge game in you know algorithms and complexity theory to take the NP problems and try to see are they NP and like thousands and thousands of problems that we care about you know can be solved efficiently, or we kind of got this system for showing that they're not NP by showing they're NP complete you know there's and the NP complete problems are like the hardest problems in NP and you know we have this uh, feature that we know none of them are NP unless all of them are NP. And you know, SAT is one NP-complete problem, and like we really don't think it's in P. We can't even figure out how to solve it in anything less than brute force time. So we kind of similarly feel that all these NP-complete problems cannot be solved efficiently. And it's like a weird, like sort of empirical fact that I mean, whenever people come up with like an algorithm's task that they want to solve, where this task is in NP, as most such tasks are. It just empirically has turned out that of all these thousands and thousands of problems, they're pretty much always we show that they're solvable efficiently in P, or we show that they're NP complete, which basically means you know they're not in P. And it's a funny situation where you know people notice that this dichotomy seems to happen for like every problem we ever think about, except for one problem that like foiled this uh, dichotomy for a long time. And uh, there's basically one problem, one famous problem, which is not known to be in P, but it's also not known to be NP complete. And you know, even when you know NP completeness was first invented in the papers of Cook and Levin in the 70s, like like 1970, Levin was like, you know, this problem is really vexing, and thus factoring. So we don't know how to do it in polynomial time, but it's also not like in this category of hardest problems in NP. So it's kind of funny that quantum computing can solve it efficiently. And I'll come back to this kind of funny property also later in the lecture. OK, so uh, yeah, again, I wanted to you know, uh, reflect on these algorithms and try to think like, OK, so if I had to summarize like what is the reason quantum algorithms could, I don't know, factor efficiently or solve SAT in this way? And yeah, the answer is I don't know. I, like I thought about it for a really long time, and I was like, I'm going to try to tell them like a succinct explanation for like this is the the one true reason. And I don't know. I couldn't think of it. I mean, I think it does have something to do with this like famous ability to compute all the answers in superposition simultaneously. That kind of came up in factoring, where kind of came up in the very last part from the last lecture, 
where we had, I mean, if you want to get into the technical details, we wanted to do rotation estimation uh, on this uh, times two mod n thing. And we were like, if we could just find any of the angles, we'd be happy and we'd factor. And so we just needed to find, you know, be able to generate a state that was in one of the planes of rotation, but we couldn't. But what we did was we took one state that we could generate, the starting state, <clears throat> and we observed that like it kind of had like an equal amount. It was like an equal superposition of all the exponentially many planes of rotation. And so we're like, okay, we'll just do rotation estimation on that. And somehow that kind of computed all the different angles of rotation in superposition. So it's kind of like we got all the exponentially many outputs together in our state. And then we measured, and we got like a random angle. And that random angle was our clue. It was like good enough for us. So it's kind of weird. It was like a weird situation where we were kind of happy to just get like a random output for our problem. But random algorithms couldn't do the same thing because um, we don't really know how to construct these vectors in the different planes. We just know how to construct their superposition. So it's like, that's kind of mysterious, but OK. And then the other thing that like kind of came up before, like interference, you know, like having positive and negative amplitudes like cancel out. Did this play a role? And I think it does play a role, but also again in like a very hidden place. Like maybe this way we did factoring was designed to, to like really hide the interesting parts. I think that interference kind of played a role in the Hadamard test. You remember the Hadamard test, which was like the central little bit of rotation estimation where you had some like vector and then you wanted to like, you had this something that would rotate it by some theta and you wanted to like understand something about this theta and you wanted to compare this vector against this vector. And the way the Hadamard test did it was like, it kind of was like, oh, I'll do a Hadamard and I'll do in a superposition, I'll get into a superposition of rotating it and not rotating it. Wait, I guess it's like not rotating it and rotating it. And then when we do add and div, like we kind of got a superposition of like the like the difference and the average and like somehow if 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 the angle was really small the difference would kind of cancel out and the average would be big and if the angle was like 90 degrees you know if it was like 180 degrees then like yeah the average would cancel out and the difference would be big so i think like that's where the um, interference and cancellation was happening and we really needed it but I must admit, like, I can't really, like, really succinctly, like, tell anybody, like, ah, here's how, let me explain to you the, the grand intuition for, like, why quantum's magic and factor. It's kind of mysterious. <laughs>